Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Praise God. We are here to magnify the Lord. We're here to build a temple for the Lord to come in and dwell. He dwells in us, but as we come together, praise God, we make a place for him to come and to dwell among us. How many are going to give the Lord some praise and honor and glory today? Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. What I'm going to do is go ahead and give you these few announcements that we have, and then we're just going to go ahead and pray and invite the presence of the Lord here in a special way, and then we're going to just go ahead and worship him and have a good time. Is that all right tonight? Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Very quickly here, there is a ladies' prayer meeting scheduled for this Thursday, January the 17th, 2013. Can you believe it? We're already in 2013 and moving forward. Praise God. And that's going to be here at the church at 6.30 p.m. All ladies are encouraged to join in for this time of fellowship and prayer. Praise God. There will be a brief meeting. Is that for this morning? That's for tonight. Okay. A brief meeting for all youth and the youth's parents today or this evening, should I say. Please make sure that at least one parent and all youth come to this meeting. And uh, we're going to meet uh, right here in front of the keyboard over here on this side, okay? So please, immediately after the service, uh, we'll give you about two or three minutes to uh, say your hellos and goodbyes. And then come over here to the front so that we can go ahead and have this meeting and we can go on from there, okay? And then finally, there will be a youth service on Friday, January the 25th at 6.30 p.m., youth start planning to attend. All right, let's thank the Lord for our announcements. Praise God. Praise God. He's good to us. Now, this evening, um, we do have several prayer requests. I am going to go ahead and read these off to you so that you know what they are. But uh, uh, Sister Hernandez, Sister Jessica Hernandez is not feeling very well tonight, so we want to remember her. And then also continue to pray for her family. I know that there are some, some things that's happening there with the family, and she needs our prayer. The family needs our prayer. And let's just see what God is going to do. You know, whenever God starts doing something in the life of people, Satan wants to jump in there and try to mess that all up. But thank God for prayer. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Praise God. And we're going to pray that that will take place, that God will will work in their lives, and he will continue to do a great thing that he has already started to do. Praise God. And, hey, when God starts something, he is going to finish it. Praise God. And so let's continue to keep them in prayer. Let's also remember Rich Fisher. He has stage 4 lymphoma, uh, which is a cancer. And we need to pray that God will take care of him. He has two boys and a wife. Um, it's a blood cancer, and it's going through. Um, he's, he has chemo that he's been working with. And the young man is only 38 years old. So we need to pray that God will touch this young man. His name is Rich Fisher. Okay? God is able to take care of that situation. Praise God. Also, let's remember the Nisley family. They are in need uh, for God to take care of them. I know that she has been trying different medicines, and um, it's only been doing very little help. They would like to see things get speeded up kind of quickly. Praise God. And God is able to do that. Amen. So let's continue Amen. to keep the Nisley family in prayer. Uh, there are several needs that's involved with that, and God's able to take care of every single one of them. So let's keep that in our hearts and in our prayer. Then also, uh, Destiny uh, uh, Pacheco, I believe is how you pronounce her last name, had a heart transplant, and the body is rejecting it. We need to pray for healing. Praise God. And for the family, because, you know, usually when the person and the individual is going through this, it doesn't just affect that person. It also affects the family and those that are with them. And so, you know, that's the beautiful thing about God. He is able to take care of the whole situation. And that's why we bring it before him, because he is able. The Bible reminds us that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above <laughs> all that we could think or even ask. That's why we could come before him boldly. How many can come before him boldly tonight? Amen. Praise God. Let's stand. Oh, hallelujah. And let's go before our God who is so willing and able to take care of every one of these situations. Oh, Lord, our God, our heavenly Father, 
Oh, Lord, we come before you this evening, oh, Lord, with so many things on our hearts. Uh, oh, Lord, but first of all, we come with praise and honor, Lord, and glory, because you are a great God, uh, and there is none that's like you. Uh, but, oh, Lord, uh, you see these requests that we have here, Lord, and I know that there's many more, Lord. Uh, there's many needs that's in this building as we speak, oh, Lord. Uh, but, oh, Lord, would you go among us, oh, Lord? Uh, would you touch these needs, oh, God? Uh, would you touch lives, oh, God, that need to be changed, oh, Lord? Uh, would would you touch bodies, oh God, that need to be helped, oh Lord? Uh, will you give jobs, oh Lord, to those that need jobs today? Uh, will you bring healing, oh Lord, to hearts, oh God, and bodies uh, that need a healing today? Uh, oh Lord, we bring these before you uh, because we know that you are able. We know that you love us, uh, and we know that we are your children tonight, oh Lord. Uh, we come with you with honor, oh God. Uh, we come with you, with, oh Lord, with thanksgiving, oh God. Uh, oh Lord, you are a wonderful Savior. We come, oh Lord, because we want to give you praise uh, and honor and glory. You are worthy of it all, O oh Lord. Uh, would you accept our praise today, O oh Lord? Uh, oh God, uh, oh, we love you today. Uh, hear the hearts and the cries of your people here, Lord, uh, as we lift you up, O oh God, uh, and be with us in this place. Uh, oh, uh, in the name of Jesus, we ask these things, God, uh, in your wonderful name. Uh, amen. Uh, amen. Hallelujah. How many are going to worship the Lord tonight? Uh, how many are going to give them their very best today? Uh, he deserves it. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. The enemy, the enemy has been defeated. God with the voice of praise. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with the voice Shout of triumph. Shout out to God. Shout out to God with the voice of praise. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Worship him with your whole heart. The enemy, the enemy has been defeated. And death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises. The enemy, the enemy has been defeated. And death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises. Shout out to God. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. Shout out to God with the voice of praise. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. Shout out to God with the voice of praise. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name. Come on, shout out to the Lord. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. Shout out to God with the voice of praise. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name. Shout out to God with the voice of praise. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up
lift your name up. We lift your name up. Worthy of all my praise He 
came to magnify. I just came to glorify. I just came to praise the Lord. Oh, he's worthy. He's worthy. Oh, there's none like you. There's none like you. Woo, Shandara Mahokosha. Yes. Shout with the voice of triumph. Shout with the voice of praise. Shout with the voice of triumph. Shout with the voice of praise. Shout unto God for the victory. Hey, hey, give the Lord a shout of praise. Hey, shout, shout with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. God is able to do 
abundantly above all more than we could ever ask or think amen praise god praise god praise god amen when you enter into the presence of the lord david said i could run through a troop and leap over a wall amen they danced and praised before him they lifted up their voice and shouted with a voice of victory amen i am so glad when god gives us freedom to worship and, you know, some say you look fanatical, you look crazy, but let me tell you something. I'd rather be crazy for Jesus any day. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. God bless you tonight. Amen. I am very excited to have a very dear friend of mine in this place. And uh, you have met him before. He has been here a few times and uh, he is good, a good friend of mine. But see, you met him after a while. Uh, I got to know him during his, uh, his time in Kingsport. And uh, I remember he used to come to church barefooted in the summertime. And he would take off running around the building. <laughs> and it got to be where the whole family would take off. And, um, you know, the, now his family is not like my family. He could make a whole NFL football team out of his family. <laughs> and uh, so they, they would come to church and, 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 and just feel the freedom of the Lord to where my father-in-law had to put stoplights out um, because they would just take off in all different directions. And so he'd say, and we had a collision at the back of the church one night, and so my father-in-law said, if you're going to run, run all this direction <laughs> so that they all went the same way. And uh, so it was, uh, it was neat to have. Amen. I'm going to ask his wife, Sister King, to stand and testify at this time. Amen. God bless. They have brought some of their family with them tonight, Gideon and Rachel King. It is good to have you guys with us tonight. Let's give them a hand clap. Amen. Brother King called me uh, a few months ago, and uh, this was before we ever even knew about what was going to happen here at the church, and he you know, had some family members in the area and that he loved very dearly and wanted to take some time to come up and visit them. And then a week or so ago, he called and said that the Lord had made a way for him to come and be here for a few, uh, be here for a few days. And so I said, well, I want you to come to church. And so you see the table up here. He's got some stuff that he brought to help him finance his trip to come up here to be a part of service with us tonight. Uh, he's not here to preach, but he is here to share a testimony with you for a few moments. And then afterwards, if you can make your way over to the table, he's got some jam and some books. I think his book that he wrote, um, that he he's probably brought that with him tonight. But just some stuff for you to do. And if you wouldn't mind stopping by over there and just talking with him for a few minutes. Because there is a group of people that we would love to be able to reach out to and minister to them. Amen. I think we should be able to minister to all people. Amen. Amen. Hey, that's what Jesus wants, right? Amen. Amen. That none, that none should not hear the gospel. Amen. So we want to do that. But I'm going to ask for the king to come at this time. And he is going to come and share with you his testimony for a few minutes. Praise the Lord Church. Well, hallelujah. Let's thank the Lord for his goodness and mercy that's new every morning. I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, it's good to be back in Lancaster. Yes, yes. It's good to be with you folks again. Yes, Always a pleasure to look forward to being with you 
we know that Brother Paris passed on to his reward. Sister Paris is still here. And what a good-looking church family is here tonight. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. But, yeah, and, and it's a pleasure to be here with Brother and Sister Eves. And yeah, our relationship goes quite a ways back, doesn't it? It's been wonderful knowing you folks. But anyhow, uh, let me share a few things that the Lord has done for us because he's been mighty good to us in, in setting us free from the traditions we were in, having lived under a sort of bondage which we at one time didn't even realize, that we were under man-made traditions, commandments of men, and I'm so thankful tonight that the Lord set a hunger in my heart for more. And that I was able to pursue that hunger and to reach out to God and to cry out to him, Lord, I need direction. I know you've got more for me. And isn't God good that he hears our prayers? God is a prayer answering God. And I'm so thankful tonight that that is true, that will always be true, that when we cry out to him, for help, for direction, for guidance and wisdom and understanding that he gives it to us. The Bible says that he that lacks wisdom to ask of the Lord, and he will give. Isn't that wonderful? So our spiritual journey has been just quite the journey in going from Amish to apostolic. And, you know, some people as we travel and get in contact with brothers and sisters in the Lord, and they find out that somebody has made the transition from old order Amish to being an apostolic Pentecostal. They're like, wow, that's hard to believe. But you know, when we have that hunger in our heart for more, God is not limited. God is totally unlimited in what he can do for us. And so in pursuing that hunger, finding out that God is more, that there is the baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. And what a privilege it is to experience that, to go through that and to experience the glorious infilling of the Holy Ghost, that baptism of the Holy Ghost that he's got for us. And I'm telling you, there's nothing in the world that I would trade for what we have now. It is just amazing the transition, the journey that God has allowed us to have. And as we've met many brothers and sisters in the Lord, as my wife uh, touched on, it's been a wonderful experience to get out and to meet so many of you. But also, uh, as we come back to Lancaster sometimes, to our home stomping grounds, because we hear from where we are trying to stay in touch, what's happening is amongst our Amish people, that God has placed a hunger in their hearts too for more. And what a joy it is. And, and I want to tell you what a joy it is to be in service tonight with our nephew and, and niece, and Gideon and Rachel King. And we're going to spend the night there. Aren't we going to have a good time together? But I just praise the Lord. And I want to tell you folks that I don't think there's ever been a stronger hunger, a stronger current amongst the Amish. It may be, some of it may be under the surface, but amongst them to receive more, to reach out, to let go of some of their traditions, and to know that God is more. And I believe that there's going to be a sweeping harvest of those precious souls for God's kingdom. Because God has said that in the end time harvest, the latter rain will be very great. And we thank him for that. So let's continue to pray, as the Bible says, for, to the Lord of harvest for labors in his harvest field. You know, it is his harvest field, and he needs labors. So let us be faithful labors for him in that field, and I wish you the Lord's great blessings, and just thank you for, for being so good to us in all the times we've been here. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
I uh, really do love this family, and uh, it was a privilege to be a part of them for, I guess, 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. And uh, so, anyways, it is so good to know that they have driven all the way up here just to be with us. Amen. Well, I guess they come up here to be with them, too. But, anyways, amen. Sister Connie is going to come, and she's going to sing for us tonight. Amen. Aren't you glad that Sister Connie's been here for the last few weeks? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. He always has to say something right be- to crack me up right before I sing. Uh, I won't. I won't tell you what he said. Uh, I'm so thankful to be here tonight. So thankful. I just before I sing, I just want to thank everybody for all your love, your sweetness, your kindness. You have just been so kind, and I know to my mom and uh, brother Paris, and I just want to thank you for being there for her and for our families and. We appreciate it, and I thank everyone for everything you have done, and you worship with me tonight.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. It's just like fire. Fire, heavenly fire. Shut up in my bones. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God is so good to us. He is so good to us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's just raise our hands. for the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Well, are you ready for the word of the Lord? Amen. Praise God. If you have your Bibles, two different scriptures tonight, real quickly, Leviticus chapter 2, verse number 13. And then Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13 as well. Amen. Leviticus chapter 2, verse number 13, it says, And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offering, thou shalt offer salt. I mean, it sounds like you want some salt, right? I feel this tonight. I, I wasn't going to preach this, and the Lord changed my mind this afternoon. So I'm just going to preach what I feel. Is that okay? 
Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. I want to preach to you tonight just on a simple topic. Don't forget the salt. Brother Sam Johnson, would you pray? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, yes. And everybody said amen. Look at your neighbor and before you're seated, say, don't forget the salt. Amen. You can be seated. Salt, also known as table salt or rock salt, is a mineral that is composed primarily of sodium chloride. It is essential for animal life. Salt is the oldest, most uh, unique food seasoning, and salting is an important method of food preservation. To taste salt or saltiness is one of the basic human tests. You actually have specific taste buds in your mouth to detect salt taste. While people have used it for canning and artificial re uh, refrigeration to preserve food for the last hundred years or so, salt has been the best known food preservative, especially for meat, for many thousands of years. Now, I came across this message when we were packing to move. When we were packing things up, we had some friends of ours that had taken some boxes from McDonald's. And I, were, I was packing one day and I came across one of the boxes and it said, don't forget the salt. Now, I had the privilege of watching a documentary afterwards, you know, when they put the fries out, you know, and, and, they, and they used that salt shaker to, to season those fries. A lot of people think, man, that's an awful lot amount of salt. But really, it only boils down to about a teaspoon of salt that they put on that entire group of fries. But McDonald's is known not for their hamburgers. Because if you really crave a McDonald's hamburger, I know a real good Christian counselor for you. I mean, I just don't get up out of the bed and say, I want to eat a McDonald's cheeseburger today. Now, I eat them. Why are y'all laughing at me? I do eat them, but more to just feel something in there that's hungry, and I eat it as fast as I can eat it. We were standing at McDonald's last Sunday night, I believe. We went out with Sister Paris, and I was standing at the counter, and I was looking. I guess I was kind of rude to the lady because I kept standing there, and my wife elbowed me. Now, I'm usually elbowing my wife, saying, what are you going to order? I just stood there. I just kept looking and looking and looking. She elbowed me, and she said, are you not going to order? And I said, I don't really want anything that's on that menu. <laughs> didn't like it. But their fries are the best thing about them. As a matter of fact, when McDonald's was created, the thing that got them off the ground was their french fries. What they did for them and, and, and creating that special blend of seasoning and salt 
to build it into something that people crave. And when they come out and they're hot and they're fresh, you can't beat it with anything else. Now, I know y'all are hungry, and that's why I'm preaching on this tonight. But the amount of salt that McDonald's uses, I came across this photo. So I want to show you something for just a moment. Not the man standing at the ocean, but that right there. Now what that is, is a McDonald's Happy Meal that is 180 days old. Not hungry anymore, are you? Taken on October the 7th, 2010. I didn't take it. It was done in a controlled environment in which they took a McDonald's Happy Meal, placed it out, and left it out for 180 days. Do you see any mold on that? It's because of the amount of salt that they put into it that they preserve it. You can take it down. So when we look at what salt does, the, the amount of preservative that it places inside of us and the amount that it does and and so on and so forth. Uh, when we understand that the salt used as a preservative, it's interesting why God chose salt on the sacrifice. So by using the salt on the sacrifice, God was saying to make the sacrifice a permanent sacrifice. <coughs> Y'all were with me when I was talking about McDonald's hamburgers. <clears throat> Read the Scripture again. Leviticus 2 and 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from... In, in other words, don't do just a little salt. But put a lot on it. <coughs> with all thine offerings thou shalt Offer salt. But it's not just a preservative. The Bible says that if it has lost its savor, savor means that the quality of the substance that it affects and the sense of taste or smell are particularly the taste or smell. If it has lost that ability to change, it is the only object on the face of the earth that you can add to something and it changes what's around it, but itself, it does not change. Mm. You ever ate something that was bland? What's the first thing you grab? Going somewhere within just a minute. Let me build this platform. So when we add the salt, the salt is needed to change what we do not like about the substance. There's nothing like taking a mouthful of mashed potatoes that tastes like cardboard. But adding the salt to it changes the aspect of what I think about the product or what I'm looking at. It's ability to put in it that makes me want more of it. I, 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 you know, to drive the thirst in you. Lay's potato chips say, I bet you can't just eat one. I haven't stopped yet. The amount of salt that's on it also makes me want to grab something to drink because it drives me for more thirstiness. But I, I don't stop eating it because I'm thirsty. I keep going further with it. However, when we understand that the ability to understand the definition of the fourth definition of savor. Now I read to you part of the definition. But listen to this definition, definition of savor. It means the power to excite or interest. 
So not only does it have the ability to make you thirsty, but it also has the ability to make you powerful and excite you and to get you interested in something. Imagine what the world would happen in our local church if we came to a point of pouring salt onto our sacrifice before the Lord. When we walk in those doors with the expectation that anything can happen in this service tonight, the only way we're ever going to get to that expectation is if we have the ability to change our world that is around us without changing ourselves to have that savor. However, if there's no commitment, you know, people would rather just live together than marry today. I, uh, got into a conversation with somebody yesterday. They've been married for seven years and they still have separate checking accounts. But they have a joint account too. And I'm thinking, you got this thing all mixed up. Now, I'm not, if you have it, I don't know. Nobody's come told me that brother, you know, Whistlebritches over there and sister Whipperdiddle, they have separate accounts, you know. They ain't nobody's told me that stuff. So I'm not here to preach on that. But what I am saying is if you're committed to something, you'll join yourself to it. I'll get there in a minute. So when we understand that when we people would rather live together than marry because they have a hard time staying in a commitment. Now they'll live together for 15 years. Get married and divorced in six months. Well, you know, what, what drove you to divorce? Irre ir unreconcilable. I won't say the ear. I don't even know how to say that word. It's unreconcilable. I know that's not a word. But I can't say the other one. They have differences that they cannot reconcile. Is that better for you grammar experts out there? It's irreconcilable. Whoa, I got it. They can't come together in agreement, but they did for 13 years before they got married. It's because now they're tied into a commitment. I don't mind coming to church uh, as long as I don't have to commit to something. But the moment you ask me to commit myself is the moment I find problems in the church. Well, honey, let me tell you something. There's a problem in every church you go to out there. There's not a perfect one out there. But let me tell you this. Thank God we're not perfect. Uh, because if we were, there would have never been a Jesus to die on a cross uh, so that you and I could have an opportunity to be saved uh, through him, we can become perfect uh, when that which is perfect is come. But we have to be committed. My pastor's wife told me when I was younger, she said, you can't help who you fall in love with, but you can sure help who you date. I don't know why I'm on this. The commitment level that you build with one another. The commitment level that you build to your church. You want to be a, you know, a musician? First learn how to clean the guitars. You want to be a sound room technician? Which I don't know why you would want to. You... Today you see me everywhere. I've been back there adjusting sound. The drums are too high. The, this is too loud. This is going this, you know. But if you want to do that, learn first how to dust around in there and see what the stuff is in there. If you want to be a preacher behind the pulpit, first learn how to do some other things around in the church. Our commitment level is something that drives us when we're committed to something. There's a problem in our churches when it comes to commitment. 
We have the lack of commitment when it comes to certain things. And because of that, we need to start taking ourselves to a place and understanding that we need to start fixing it right now. See, there's a spiritual crisis that's taking place in America. Look at this. Christians by generation. 65% of the World War II generation claim to be Christians. Not bad. But the very next generation, which is called the baby boomer generation, only 35% of them claim to be Christians. Oh wait. Generation X, which is my generation, only 15% of those claim to be Christians. Oh, it gets worse. Of generation Y, which is my children's generation, only 4%. Why? Because our churches have lost their savor. There's nothing exciting going on. And I'm not talking about a Super Bowl Sunday. And I'm not talking about a youth trip and whether we got this going on or that going on. I'm talking about when we walk in the back doors. You can't feel the presence of God. You just hear somebody just being an oracle up there, building a sermon and giving you some ideas of how to live a little bit better life. But let me tell you something. If there's not Jesus in the building, it doesn't make a difference how good of a speaker I am you won't find anything in it but when you get committed and you understand that regardless of what my neighbor's doing or whether they live for God I'm going to live for God as for me and my house we will serve the Lord it doesn't make a difference if everybody else goes to hell I'm going to go to heaven There seems to be no stickability. No accountability. Pastor, don't ask me to do anything. What are we really saying is, is I don't want to do nothing. Now, I'm not preaching this because anybody said anything. I'm preaching this because we're in a new era of life. And as we go forward, we need to have some ability to be held accountable to what we believe and what we preach. And understand that if I'm going to live for God, that I am held accountable by God. Oh, folks, I'm not going to come fire you as a saint. Lord, I'm not going to call you in the office every time I think you're doing something wrong? That's not my job. My job is to preach it to you. It's your job to live it. Hey, hey, I'm, I'm just telling you. I mean, think of what Jesus did. The woman caught in the act of adultery. Now, when you're caught in the act of adultery, I don't think they gave her time to get cleaned up before she went before Jesus. And they threw her at His feet. We don't see Jesus standing there judging her and and telling her what she should and shouldn't do. We see Jesus looking at the ones that were doing the judging. If you are without sin in your life, let you be the first to cast a stone at her. I was reading the other night where Jesus is telling them that you need to get the own thing out of your own eye before you start looking at somebody else's eye. You need to fix your own self first. Make your commitment level what it needs to be. See, our idea of commitment level is if I'm living it a little stronger than my neighbor. If I'm doing it a little bit better than they are, then I, I must be okay. No. When you're living for Jesus like you're supposed to, you got the blinders on and all you see is Jesus. That's a committed life. That's somebody that wants to live for Him. That's somebody that's after something. 
The sacrifice was unacceptable without the salt to preserve it. It was not done unless they put a lot of salt on it. It was the savor of the salt that God wanted to come into contact with and it was the fact that the sacrifice was to be permanent that excited God that allowed Him to pour His power down upon the people. And if God is the same yesterday... If he's the same yesterday and today and forever, if the principle behind the sacrifice was for us to understand that it was a permanent thing before God, then our walk with God should be a permanent aspect. Y'all catching what I'm saying? We read this scripture this morning. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now we talked about the reasonable service of it. Now I want to talk about the sacrifice of it. What is a sacrifice? Well, let me just give you an idea. Now, I'm going to use this example not to get on to anybody, so don't take it the wrong way and leave out of here and say, Brother Eves was preaching on money. No laughing this time. I had a man that I used to pastor years ago. We needed to raise some money for some new chairs. I got up and took pledges. I said, this church has a bunch of brand new chairs. They overbought their chairs. Instead of returning them, they offered to give it to us at a third of the price in which they paid for them. They'd, uh, they had raised the money, so they were paid for. A third of the price that they paid for them and no shipping. And it was enough chairs to seat our church. And all I needed was $2,500. So I got up, took pledges. I said, I understand this is going to be a sacrifice. I'm not asking you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. Who would give me X amount of dollars? I said, I'll give you so many days to pay it out. The church will pay it, and then we'll reimburse the church. So I think I was going to give them like four months. Pretty good deal, right? Pledge paid out over four months. Man raised his hand in the church, paid the most tithes of anybody in the church. The only reason I knew that is because he told you. He said, I'll give you $1,000. Hey, I only got 1500 more to go, right? So he goes and he goes to his wife. And he says, now I want you to take a couple of hundred dollars out of my tithes a month to go toward this pledge. That's not a sacrifice. A sacrifice means that if I've got the light bill due, and the Lord places upon my heart to give to a situation, knowing that I don't have enough money to do both, that I give to the situation God told me to do, which is a sacrifice, freely and willingly, believing that God's going to take care of the rest. And I've seen it done time and time again. not saying that because we need to raise money. I'm saying that because that's the easiest example I know to tell you what a sacrifice is. A sacrifice means that you're willing to get up and move your family across the world if you have to just to win one soul. A sacrifice means uh, that you're willing to go beyond what anybody else says uh, because you want to see somebody touched uh, by what God can do, not what you can do. When you're willing to sacrifice, uh, living sacrifice, uh, that means...
means I don't come up here and drink a poison and die. That's not the sacrifice God's talking about. It means that when I get up in the morning till the time I go to bed at night, I will live, breathe, eat, and talk Jesus. Why? Because I want the world to know what he has done for me. And if there's anything I can do to help them know that God is able. Colossians 4 and 6 says this. Let your speech be always way with grace, seasoned with salt that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. God wants your service. That's why He said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I'd rather you be hot or cold. There's nothing like a lukewarm cup of coffee. See, I don't like coffee anyways, but that's the one thing I could say that I think I can get you to understand. If I'm going to drink coffee, it's going to be hot. Well, or iced coffee. It's either got to be hot or cold, sis. It can't be lukewarm. I mean, that's just the thing. He doesn't want us straddling the fence. He doesn't want us just giving it a half effort. He doesn't want us just to say, I'll do it when I can. He wants us to say, I'll do it no matter what it takes to get it done. He wants us seasoned with salt so that the Savior can service them. God wants us to be a committed individual. See, here's the issue to serve God. It's easy when you go to youth congress or youth camp. It's easy when you go to a conference or a convention. It's easy when you got 80-something people in the building. It's easy. It's what you do when you're by yourself. I shared this statistic with the youth committee last week. And it was appalling. And even looking at their faces, I saw the concern in their eyes. But this is a true statistic that I read. That 95% of our children, ages 9 to 12 years old, have viewed pornography while getting ready for their homework. Because the salt has lost its savor. I remember seeing parents buying their kids TV mature games, not even knowing what the game says or what it does, just because they want it for Christmas. What is that uh, Black Ops? What? I don't know. I just know they want it. Folks, we got to build some commitment into our lives and start at our front door. When God, if there's anything that walks through this door, I rebuke it, I curse it, I bind it, and I cast it down to where if they put something in that Xbox, it don't even play. Because if we're committed, to seeing people saved, then we walk a committed life. We talk a committed life. We live a committed life every single day of our life. But living a committed life means that we also need to have unity. Glad I got two amens out of that one. See, if a church is not unified for a purpose, we're never going to get anything done. There was a story I came across, a peanut cartoon story. 
in which Lucy was telling Linus to change the television channel. Now, might make you think, you know, how in the world can she come in here and demand me do anything, right? Well, look at this picture for a second. He said, what makes you think you can come in here and demand me do anything? And she said this. You see these five fingers? By themselves, they are nothing. But together, they become a weapon to be dealt with. And he asked her, what channel do you want me to turn it to? If we understand and look like those fingers and get organized and unify ourselves and be committed together, there is nothing, let me say it again, there is nothing that the devil can withhold from us and tell us it don't belong to us. If one can send a thousand to flight and two ten thousand, you do the math. If we come together as a church and stand arm in arm and say, I will do whatever it takes and we have salt added to our sacrifice there is nothing that is too hard for God see unity is always the way to go God has always been that one where he can take Gideon and 200 men because they were unified and defeat an army. You can't serve God by yourself if you're trying to do it all alone. But you can serve God by yourself if you've got God involved. Integrity is not what people think about you. I mean, I think highly of all of you in here I like you all but that doesn't mean you have integrity integrity is what you do when you're all alone when nobody else is watching what you do by yourself and how you serve God and the salt that you built in your relationship with him that's what builds integrity See, it reminds me of the story in 1 Kings chapter 18 where Elijah has been put in a place where he tells Ahab, it's not going to rain until I say so. Now, I believe that I have a close relationship with God. I would really want to know that I've got some salt in my sacrifice before I tell you guys it's not going to rain until I tell you it's going to rain. But Elijah had built this relationship and when he told Ahab it wasn't going to rain, it did not rain for three years. A drought is a prolonged and chronic shortage of lack of something that's expected or desired. Look at this. 450 prophets of Baal prayed that their God would pour fire from heaven. While they prayed, Elijah's walking around repairing the altar of God and beginning to build that relationship all over with him. And then he digs a ditch around the altar. And after they had prayed all day, Elijah began his prayer. There was no fire built under the altar. You don't want to know why? Because you can't build your own fire. It's something that God has to do. If you're anointed, You can get up and preach about a bottle of water and people will listen if you're anointed. If you're not anointed, you got to turn your church into a social club to get people to come. 
Fire is something that God does. It's a God thing. And let me explain to you why it's a God thing. So, Elijah, in the middle of a drought, tells them to bring 12 barrels of water. And rained in three years. 12 barrels. Now, where are they going to get 12 barrels of water? I don't know. But a barrel is 55 gallons. Times 12 is 660 gallons of water that he takes and pours on the sacrifice and the altar and spills it on the ground. (laughs) Does that make you thirsty? In a drought for three years and you're going to pour out 660 gallons of water? You better have some sacrifice with salt in it. You better be willing to know that you've got the goods if you're going to make that kind of sacrifice. Not only did he pour, that God pour fire from heaven, not only did he show Elijah that I'm going to back you up every step of the way, not only did he show up and show out, but he killed the 450 prophets of Baal and licked up every bit of the water and never hinged a hair on Elijah's head. That's something to say about the church of the living God. If we're willing to make the commitment for God, there is nothing my God can't do. Doesn't matter what your position is, where you go to church, who your pastor is, who your daddy is, or who you might think you are. It is whether you're determined to be preserved and be committed and stick it out no matter what comes your way. We said earlier, Joshua said, you can go serve your gods if you want to. But as for me and my house, that needs to be a commitment that you have every single day. See, I'm going to touch on something for just a moment, and I'm going to to close up shop. You ever read about the phylactery? How many has read about that? Let me explain to you what it is. Law about Deuteronomy 6 and 4. He told them to put it in a phylactery. It was a little tube. The scripture was written on a parchment piece of paper. They put it in the uh, put it in that tube and, and they, they wore it on their right hand or on their forehead, right between their eyes. They also placed it on their doorpost. That no matter where they went or what they did, that Scripture was a constant presence in their mind. Now I'm saying that to say this. That's a commitment. A commitment means that it doesn't make a difference what the world says. It doesn't make a difference what my family says. It doesn't make a difference what my co-worker says. It doesn't make a difference what anybody else says around me. I know I have a relationship that I have to build before God and that I have to live for Him every single day of my life. Now that doesn't mean God doesn't place men in your life to give you ideas and examples and give you something to shoot for and a preacher in your face to tell you how to be saved. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying though is when all the dust settles and all the smoke is gone and everything else of subsides it's about your personal relationship that you have built before God and that you're walking it every single day of your life from the time you get up till you go to bed I have to walk for the Lord commitment to be preserved I need to stick with him no matter what comes my way no matter who persecutes me, no matter what my friends may think of my salvation, 
I must stick to him. No matter what fake Christian hurts me with slander, I cannot back out on my God because of a hypocrite. God will not look at me, or excuse me, he will not leave me or forsake me. But those things become who we are if we're committed. See, all are called, but few are chosen. Chosen people are the people that are committed. See, we use that scripture the wrong way. We say, well, all are called, but few are chosen. As if God goes down through there and says, I like this grape, but I don't like this grape. That's not how it goes. You're all called. And a calling is without repentance. It's not His will that any should perish. Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. He's telling them, you've crucified the Christ. I don't know about you, but if I killed the Messiah, I could just expect that that's not a good thing. You've crucified Him. You've killed Him. So they look at Him. Say, what can we do? Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now do you see anywhere in that Scripture where it says that speaking in tongues in the Holy Ghost stops? No. It's to all. As many as the Lord our God shall call. All are called, but few are chosen. Because chosen takes commitment. God called Noah, but he didn't talk to him for 120 years after he called him. <laughs> now, think about this for a moment. We barely make it with three services a week. Imagine if you didn't hear from God for 120 years. Not a conversation. I'm sure he taught. I mean, I'm sure he prayed. I have no doubt he did. Because I know I would have the first time I went out looking for gopher wood. I wouldn't even know where to start. Or I've got to build a boat with many rooms and fit all these animals. I don't even know. Lord. <laughs> but he was called. But his chosen ability came from his commitment to continue even in the drought of 120 years without a word from God. And when the day came, he was ready. And not only did he save himself and his wife, but his children and their wives and all of the animals that God had placed in front of him. Can you endure your calling even in the quiet times when you don't hear from God? Oh, but Brother Eves, I, I've prayed and I've prayed and I haven't gotten my answer. Sometimes the answer is just no. Sometimes He's not ready to give the answer because you're not ready to hear it. You don't always have to. Stumble if you're committed. My aunt used to say this. She said, 
living for God is hard when you do it the easy way. But living for God is easy if you do it the hard way. Meaning that when I make that choice to live for Him, I'm going to live for Him. Can you endure your calling when you don't hear from God? You don't always have favor with everybody that's around you. Your family may shun you. Your friends may leave you. Your kids may not understand it. But you're called. See, it's time to get our lives and our sacrifices covered with the sweet savor of salt. With God to come into our services and fill our lives with His Spirit. When we leave day after day from the presence of the Lord that we go back to our homes and our mundane lives with spice in our step, savor in our talk, excitement in our lives, and draw an interest of people toward us. That others will be thirsty for what you have. You see, understand this. When you stand by yourself against the storms of life, you feel like a house standing against a tornado. But when you stand before God, and understand His ability, you see the rainbow through the storm. You are the salt of the earth. You are what makes this world taste better to God. See, if you weren't here, He'd have done gave up a long time ago. Because it would be bitter, horrible tasting, and bland. Oh, you ever walked into a house that was cooking something? And you smelled it and you just like, mm, mm, mm. I can't wait to taste that. Mm. My mouth, I'm hungry right now. Y'all hungry? It's stirring, it's simmering just right. Oh, ooh, I can't. I wonder if God is sitting on the edge of his throne right above Lancaster, Pennsylvania saying, I can't wait till they cook something up in that church service. Uh, I can't wait to taste what they taste like. Ooh, that praise uh, that's coming up, uh, that's simmering in my nose. Uh, oh! And he gets a little bit excited and interested and he starts pouring down the power and the ability that we need uh, to make it through the next day. What a God we serve. Stand together. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Sin will take you further than you ever want to go. But a commitment will carry you through all the way. It's your choice of whether or not you want to be committed to God all the way or if you want to live in the lack of commitment. My question to you tonight is how committed are you? So we're going to open up the altars and give you a chance to come and reestablish yourself in a commitment with God. If you don't have the Holy Ghost in this building, tonight is your night if you want it. And it's not that hard. Well, what's the Holy Ghost, Brother Eves? Well, let me tell you what it is. It's a reflection of your commitment before the Lord. 
When you decide you're going to commit yourself, God indwells His Spirit inside of you. Well, how do I know that commitment is real? The Bible says they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. What's that? It means you're going to talk in a language that's not anything you know. Well, that sounds creepy. It's not when it happens. I promise you, if you ever get that experience, you're going to walk out of here. The Bible says that they looked at those men on the day of Pentecost and said, these men are drunk. They acting weird. Peter said, we're not drunk like you think we are. <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm not intoxicated. I'm just not intoxicated by man's ability. I'm intoxicated by God's ability. And intoxication takes place and makes us not have the ability to do things on our own. The Spirit of the Lord comes in and stirs that Spirit within us. Joel said that He will fill us with a new wine. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And they shall speak with a new tongue. What an ability. That commitment level. Some of you tonight have spoken tongues, but it's been a little while. Some of you haven't really completed that commitment level with God because you're afraid of what, what might take place or what may go on. Well, let me tell you tonight, tonight's your night if you choose it. My question to you tonight is how committed are you? As they began to sing and these altars open up, who's going to be the first one to say, I'm committed? I'm going to go wherever the Lord tells me to go and I'm going to do whatever He tells me to do. There's one. Who else? There's two. Come on, somebody. There's three. I'm committed. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to do what He's called me to do. I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to break. Worthy is thy Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song. It's all heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is thou, Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song, sing a new song. It's on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing.
blessing and honor strengthen glory and power be to you the only wise king holy holy are you lord holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come I'm filled with wonder, I'm filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous Mystery. What's his name? Jesus, your name. Jesus, your name is power. Breath and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. Was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Your royal 
blessing and honor, glory and power and praise. Unto the one who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb, we owe blessing and honor, glory and power and praise. Unto the one, unto the one who sits on the throne. Sing and honor, glory and power and praise. For you are, you are holy, you are holy. One we will fall in love in a mighty chorus. You are holy. ability to serve God comes from the strength that you receive from the joy that He gives you. That joy comes from the ability to worship Him. Meaning that you need to be committed to Him. I want to be committed. I want to love Him like He loves me. I want to worship Him as much as He loves me. 
And I want to give him my everything just like he gave it to me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Aren't you grateful? In the name of Jesus. Aren't you grateful? I pray that you leave this service tonight with a new commitment. If you leave here with a lack of a commitment, it's because you chose not to be committed. And I pray that the Lord will help you and strengthen you to a commitment to serve Him. It's up to you on what you give the Lord. Amen, amen. Don't forget, Brother David King has a table set up. Looks like some jams and some books. I think it would be very much in order for you to walk by, help him finance his ministry. Man, we want to know that we are helping taking care of those that are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you will walk by and and help him, I'm sure he's got different flavors there, and there's got to be something that will tickle your tongue. (laughs) There is a quick youth meeting in about five minutes right over here in this section. Please, parents, be a part of that meeting because there are some things that I want to make sure that are clear, and uh, we want you to be a part of that. Amen. All minds clear? Please remember the prayer request. Continue to pray for those. Sister Paris, do you have anything you'd like to say being your last service? I know you've talked a lot the last few weeks. Well, come on. You can be seated. I didn't want to end this service without giving her an opportunity. You don't have to stand down there. Come on up here. Amen. This is not my favorite place. (laughs) But you got a calling. (laughs) I want to say that we are serving an awesome God. I'm in awe of God. In awe. What does that word mean? It means I don't have a better explanation. Because he is awesome. He is wise, most wise God. He knew who we were when we were in our mother's womb. That's right. He knew our future at that same second. Yet he looked beyond our faults and saw our needs. So grateful that he allowed me to hear the plan of salvation as a young girl so grateful for my walk with him he's the best friend anybody could ever expect and yet we don't even know if we give our everything to him we are just touching the hem of his garment in friendship just touching the love that he has for us and if we endure to the end to the end, then we're going to see him in reality and everything he has for us in heaven for eternity. It's not just this life here that we can be blessed, so blessed, but it's eternity after this life here. I want to thank him for his grace in my life, for his mercy, for walking beside me all my life. I thank him because I have a relationship with him. And that relationship is what it is today because of the word that your pastor preached, my pastor, our pastor preached tonight, commitment. As a nine-year-old girl, didn't know nothing, absolutely nothing. I'm not saying you nine-year-olds don't know nothing. I did not know that there was a Jesus. I didn't know that there was a God. My mother was Catholic, and we had 16 children, so she didn't have time to teach me about Jesus. But somehow it's 
church bus come by my house, and I asked mom, mom, can I go to church? She said, anybody that wants to go, just go, because the, the idea was I'm going to get rid of half of you kids if you go. <laughs> now that I've had five children of my own, I understand what my mother was saying. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> what didn't matter what church bus it was. But she let us go, and I thank God because as a nine-year-old girl, little girl that didn't know nothing, I felt the love of God in the first time in my life. Didn't know that I was looking for love. Because you're, you're a child of 16, I was the sixth child, and I never felt loved. I knew my mom loved me, but I, there was something lacking. I needed something. I needed my own personal relationship with somebody that I knew that loved me with a guarantee that it was real love yes. and I felt that when I went to church yes. I gave my life to God and God came down and accepted the little bit that I had to offer him and that night I told the Lord if you will continue to love me I will give you my entire life I made a commitment that day not knowing what I was being committed to but I knew there was a love that I wanted, I needed. I felt good for the first time in my life, and I wanted to do that. I wanted to keep on keeping on with God, and God blessed me with a made-up mind. A nine-year-old girl, you think, well, they don't know what they're doing. Don't you ever say that. Don't ever think that. These little kids are innocent. They're going to get everything that we offer them, and they're going to be the church of today, not tomorrow. They're the church of today. And I thank God that he accepted me in my ignorance, in my not knowing, in my childlike faith. He accepted me. And he, I continued walking with him, and he gave me a made-up mind. Amen. Church, I want to see you all around the throne. I want to see you all there, but if you don't go, I am going. That's right. I am going. That's right. I want to make it. I, I've, I've come too far to turn back now. I've given God all my life, and you know, we, the pastor taught on sacrifice. It is better to sacrifice than to dis be disobedient, because sacrifice is going to get you to a place in God. Nothing else will get you there. Be willing to do whatever God asks you to do, whether you want to do it or not, whether you understand what God's asking you to do or not, just be obedient. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You think, oh boy, what a price I had to pay. You know what? I would go back and repeat everything I did if I knew that sacrifice that I made is going to get me where I'm at today. Because I can feel God's presence. I can feel him in my life. I know his grace. I know his love. I know his mercy. I know his fellowship. And just to have a relationship with God Almighty. I'm not talking about a statue. I'm not talking about this thing here. or this. Th I am talking about the real God, the live Amen. God, the God of the universe. Amen. I am, uh, it, this is real. This is real. And if you've never felt God's presence, just ask him to come into your life and allow him to do that. Because this is real. I've never felt this anywhere, anytime, any place. Because this, there's only one God. And I'm serving that one God tonight. And I praise him so much. Church, I am, let's say that brother, the pastor said this is my last night here. I'm going on a vacation. <laughs> I'll be back. It ain't going to be a two-week vacation as per usual as it has been in the nine, nine, last nine years. But I'm going on a vacation. I will return by the grace of God because this is my church. Amen. This is my church. So this will be my last night here for a while. I will return if the Lord allows me to live and gives me the grace. I will be back because you are my family. You are my family, and I'm not, I'm not going to say... Bye, I'm going to say so long for a while. Amen. And if the Lord Amen. comes before I see you in this building again, I'll see you up there. Amen. That's my goal. Yes. I want to see. I want to see the man. 
I want to see the man that died for me. Amen. That I may live. And right. nothing that I have to offer him. But he died. If none of you was even in the world, he would have died for me. Amen. Just me. I want to see him. I want to be able to, with a holy language, tell him how I appreciate him. Thanks. I just want to tell him how thankful I am yes. that he put up with me. That he Amen. allowed me to serve him. This is a privilege to live for God. It's not a chore. It's not a have to. I don't have to come to church. I want to come to Amen. church. I get to come to church. I don't have to pray. I get to pray. Thank you, Jesus. I don't have to live for God. I get to live for God. It's a privilege. Amen. God Almighty, look down on this poor sinner's soul and save me. That is a privilege. I am blessed. Church, I am blessed. And I'm, le I'm closing this journey here only to begin another journey. I have another journey, and I don't know where it's at, who it's with, only it's with God. Amen. And I want to pay, if, if it's a sacrifice, I don't consider it a sacrifice. I count it a privilege. I want to get on with that journey because there might be one more soul I may be able to talk to. I may be able to lift up. I don't know where God's taken me, and really it doesn't matter because he's in charge. He is the boss. I have no right saying, God, what are you doing? Why? Because he is in charge. He knows what he's doing. He looks beyond my faults and sees my need. He knows my future. And I thank him tonight because he's such a great, 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 big, wonderful God. And he has not disappointed me yet. Thank you. Love you all. Well, we're going to miss you. Can't wait to see you. But if I don't get to see you on this side, promise me a thousand years on the ring of Saturn. <laughs> All right. God bless you. Don't forget the youth meeting. Brother Richardson, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?